Um, it's my job today to turn some of the legalese into plain language, so I'm going to take a shot at it, and I'm going to just go over some of the basic rules. Um, uh, we were asked by the organizers of this conference to remember back to 1992 and 1993, where some of us were mere children, um, about the promises that were made uh, about NAFTA, and specifically this particular chapter of NAFTA, which is called NAFTA Chapter 11, has nothing to do with U.S. bankruptcy law, just happens to be number 11 in the list of uh, NAFTA chapters. And at that time, uh, major U.S. firms uh, were arguing that uh, this NAFTA agreement was going to be great uh, because it was going to really up the level of foreign direct investment um, in each other's economies. And there'd be a lot of cross-border investment, a lot of uh, moving around U.S. corporations would be opening offices in Mexico and Canada, buying up smaller corporations, um, buying up real estate, buying up public services and assets, and uh, bringing the joys of fast food and blue light specials uh, to everyone in the, in the Americas. Um, the promised benefits were uh, more jobs, uh, higher standard of living, uh, less immigration. It was a necessary precondition uh, for this investment. Uh, uh, major corporations were arguing for NAFTA um, Chapter 11 type rules, which were borrowed from previously existing bilateral investment treaties. Um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, rules in this agreement. Now, most of you know that uh, trade agreements contain rules that allow states to bring complaints against states and um, or countries to bring complaints against countries and usually in those cases um, uh, the rule or regulation that's being challenged as a trade barrier needs to be changed or um, punitive sanctions can be applied to that country. Um, NAFTA contains those types of rules and uh, for instance the NAFTA trucks case um, that uh, uh, resulted in an order to allow uh, NAFTA trucks into the United States was a state-to-state -state dispute between Mexico and Canada. Um, this particular chapter of NAFTA creates a second mechanism, a, a, a sort of parallel mechanism. It's called an investor-to-state mechanism, and it allows in major investors, largely corporations, uh, to uh, challenge policies that negatively impact their investments directly. So to sue governments directly under NAFTA, to enforce the terms of the treaty directly without having to go through their own government or you know, political process outside the domestic court system. So it's their own sort of private little justice system built into NAFTA. And they utilize previously existing institutions um, uh, like the World Bank's Center for Arbitration like the United Nations arbitration rules, so previously existing institutions that were largely um, that were largely created for sort of private disputes um, uh, to be the places where these uh, where these arbitrations are heard, and they're heard in trade tribunals, um, often behind closed doors. Even though the United States government has pledged that all the proceedings that they're going to be involved in are going to be open. Just last week, there was a hearing in a case that was not open uh, in, in Washington involving a, a Canadian cattleman's claim against the United States due to the closure, the United States closure of the border when mad cow disease was discovered in Canada. We closed the border to cattle and uh, beef. When um, a party wins, when, when a corporation wins one of these NAFTA suits, uh, the policy that's being challenged um, is not changed, but cash compensation can be awarded. And um, uh, when we're talking cash compensation, we're talking about a lot of money. There's no rule set on how much money can be awarded. And I think, and anybody can correct me if you're wrong, the highest award in a BITS case, in a bilateral investment treaty case, was uh, 315 million, which is quite a lot of money. Um, and the rules, um, uh, for bringing these kinds of suits are very broad. Uh, the definition of investor is very broad. Um, and the definition of investment is even broader. And, they, and these definitions get longer every time a new free trade agreement is negotiated. 
Um, so in the Peru and Panama agreement, there's even a longer list or a list of investment and investor. And they can bring cases on um, four or five grounds. Um, one article of NAFTA called uh, the, the, what we call the expropriation article, guarantees for investors compensation from the treasuries of governments for any direct government expropriation um, or any action that's tantamount to an expropriation or an indirect expropriation. So what does that mean? Um, tantamount to an expropriation, indirect expropriation are pretty broad, um, pretty broad concepts. And, um, and they resulted, for instance, in the metal clad case um, between the United States and Mexico, which involved a uh, US company wanting to set up a toxic waste facility, a local municipality denying the construction permits for this facility, um, and a ruling in this case uh, that uh, regulatory takings had occurred that would not meet the US standard for this type of taking. Um, another rule uh, is uh, Article 1102, which is called the National Treatment or Non-Discrimination Rule, and it requires governments to treat foreign investors no less favorably than domestic investors with respect to all phases and aspects of their investment. So this is a standard rule in trade policy, um, but it's being used by a lot of investors. For instance, the Canadian cattlemen who are bringing this case um, are alleging uh, trade discrimination, but this is what we mean by discrimination, or what the claimants mean by discrimination. Um, another article that's being relied on heavily by these um, uh, investors is a minimum standard of treatment provision, which requires investors to be given treatment in accordance with international law, including fair and equitable treatment and full protection and security. And this, um, this clause, or these clauses used to have some meaning uh, in a prior context, um, but the, it, it's sort of vague catch-all language that's been used by NAFTA tribunals to really expand these concepts. And my favorite case was the Pope and Talbot case, where um, it was a forestry case or a softwood lumber case between Canada and the United States. And the Canadian officials were auditing this uh, US firm, and they were admittedly rude. And their rudeness uh, became an international law violation under NAFTA, and the Pope and Talbot succeeded in uh, winning, um, um, winning uh, uh, quite a bit of money from um, the United States uh, due to this um, unfair and unequitable treatment. And the last article I wanted to talk about is Article 1106, which uh, forbids the use of performance requirements, which is a term describing um, conditions that you might place on investment, um, such as you know requiring the domestic content um, or the employment of locals or those types of things. And Maude this morning uh, mentioned that ExxonMobil is now suing Canada over one of their province's um, attempts to uh, place some performance requirements on ExxonMobil. So those are the rules, and I need to su summarize some of the results real quickly. Um, there have not been a lot of cases uh, in NAFTA so far. There have not been a lot of them adjudicated. It takes a lot of money to go forward with one of these cases. Um, but this model is spreading. It's in all the free trade agreements that we're negotiating now. It's in Peru and Panama. It's in Korea. It's in um, Colombia. Those are the votes coming up in the United States um, soon. And uh, the cases, the number of cases under those free trade agreements, the number of cases under the bilateral investment treaties, which you know now we have thousands upon thousands of bilateral investment treaties, are really exploding. And so the corporations have gotten this private you know, road of justice um, that uh, only they can use um, with rules that favor them, broadly worded rules that favor them. Um, and it's outside the domestic court system. And yet one of the other consequences or one of the results I want to point out of this is that court decisions themselves, domestic court decisions themselves, can be actionable in this system. And we've had a few US court decisions uh, um, uh, challenge in this tribunal system, which lead to questions about the constitutionality of this tribunal system, uh, leads to questions about who is the highest court in the land if U.S. Supreme Court cases can be adjudicated afterwards and after Chapter 11 tribunals for cash compensation. Another trend in these cases is that a lot of actions by state governments, provincial governments, local governments are being challenged. And um, you know, it's an attack, and especially if a new government comes in and decides to have new policies, 
countries. Um, there's, you know, it's a sort of attack upon democracy itself. If a new government isn't allowed to change course on any issue and, and not allowed to create new policies that may adversely impact uh, investors. Um, the threat, another trend is that there's the threat of these cases is having a chilling effect on a lot of public policy initiatives. When Philip Morris threatens Canada with a giant, uh, you know, trade suit, or when some, when Exxon, you know, <laughs> threatens Canada with a giant trade suit, when the the amounts being um, amounts being demanded are so extreme, um, it is a threat um, uh, both for developed countries, but particularly for developing countries. And many developing countries, for instance, Argentina is facing about 30 of these cases. And these, they're, they're demanding 20 million, 30 million. Th that's a huge chunk of money. Uh, let me leave it there. I just threw out some of the um, uh, rules and consequences, and we'll save, I think, our questions for later. <laughs>